So François Massard was a French architect credited with introducing classicism into Baroque architecture of France. The Encyclopedia Britannica cites him as the most accomplished of 17th century French architects whose works are renowned for their high degree of refinement, subtlety, and elegance. Mansart, as he is generally known, made extensive use. Uh, extensive use of what? <laughs> refinement, subtlety, and elegance. I don't know. I took this text from somewhere. This was the man. Uh, at that time, architects still uh, sported the mustache. Very few architects still wear mustaches. Uh, I don't know why something happened. The mustache is not so popular any longer uh, with, uh, not just with architects, with, with uh, men in general. Maybe it will come back. Anyway, this is Mansar. And uh, this is, uh, I forgot, ah, with, uh, with Perrault. They worked for Perrault, was one of the architects of the Louvre. And uh, probably Mansar also worked uh, for the Louvre. At that time, the architects still had the confidence to point as uh, Perrault does with his finger towards uh, whatever, the horizon, the future, the, the imperial uh, uh, patronage, or I don't know. I forgot what this is. Let me see. I, I, I made this presentation a while ago. Maybe, maybe I embarrass myself and uh, that I'm not actually as well prepared as I should have been. Maybe I should have stopped. Fate, Sorana, Sorina, Sorana, maybe you should reconsider. Um, anyway, I am in it now. We see some buildings by uh, Francois Mansart. Um, I, I think I, I, I know what it is. I prepared this uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, two years ago or so, and I didn't make the presentation for, for some reason. Here we see a, 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 an engraving uh, of, of, of Mansart. Uh, at that time, not everybody had the chance to have uh, the, the portrait engraved, but uh, an accomplished architect like Mansara, of course, he did. Uh, and another engraving, but most of the time, these engravings were um, uh, done by engravers after the death of the, the one they engraved. So the, the accuracy of the portrait is only, <laughs> is only, um, know, uh, approximate. Uh, but I, I don't know why uh, I'm a little bit about uh, uh, Ah, I know. Uh, this was a, uh, just, a, 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 you know, a, an imperfect introduction. He made it also uh, on some back notes, but or no, on, on the stamps, as you can see. This is actually the, the, the dream of any architect, to make it on a stamp, you know. Uh, uh, if you arrive on a stamp, it means uh, posterity um, uh, values you very much. And uh, <laughs> he did. He arrived there. And uh, the Mansard is here. Uh, it's possible that it comes from his name, uh, the word Mansard, if not him from his uh, relative, uh, the other Mansard, Chateau de Maison, the castle of, of, of houses. Well, uh, we see the castle, we don't see really the maison, uh, the houses. But just like in the case of Philippe Webb, <clears throat> we see <clears throat> the importance of the roof and the importance of the chimneys. And yeah, the building is well designed. It is uh, an equilibrium, there is a balance and, uh, and uh, the proximity of the lake, uh, of the water adds to the poetry of, the, of what we see. And then uh, the building, uh, of course, it's a building for the rich and powerful. It's a building uh, uh, that celebrates opulence. Uh, it's a building for an aristocrat. Uh, what can we say? This was the age. And not too many buildings for the poor built then. Uh, now is different. In this respect, I think our uh, age is a little more considerate towards those who are less privileged by uh, faith and by other considerations, perhaps. A chateau, a castle. And it is impressive still. Val de Grasse, Paris, <laughs> a great church. Uh, truly a great church. 
Mansart, François Mansart. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the, the most important buildings uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Paris. Until, of course, uh, now I'm sarcastic, if you allow me to be sarcastic, uh, Renzo Piano built his uh, Palais de Justice the Justice Palace, which I think is a horror. I just don't understand how Renzo Piano is still allowed to practice architecture after he built that uh, uh, monstrous, the monstrous uh, uh, building in, in Paris uh, rather recently. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Tour Eiffel now seems quite subdued uh, compared to the tall building for the Palais de Justice by Renzo Piano. Incredibly insensitive that building, I think. But on the other hand, he had to build a building for 11,000 lawyers visiting the building or working in the building a day. I know because I wanted to take part in that competition too. And I had an interesting idea. I, I wanted to, uh, instead of building a palace of justice, Tribunal in Romanian. I, I wanted to be la fuite de justice, coliba justice, la fuite de justice, and I can explain to you why. Uh, now I know it's it's apparently unrelated to Mansar, but I want to tell you an interesting story. This competition asked for the glorious palace of justice in Paris, and the little devil in me, uh, or maybe not so little. Uh, whispered to me to make the very opposite, a banal little hut, a colibre. And uh, I, I, with the earth obtained from, from excavating the earth around the, the, the palace of justice, which was necessary, I would have created a mound, a hill above a, a building by Tracinet, an industrial uh, structure, and above the hill, a little hut where a very old man uh, would distribute justice to whoever needed it. And what is very interesting, a, a French woman told me that in France, Saint Louis, Saint Louis is on the, uh, the effigy of Saint Louis is in every uh, palace of justice of France because he was a saint who was doing exactly without knowing anything about this saint my old man in the hut uh, would have done to distribute justice without bureaucracy, without lawyers, without the industry of uh, so-called distributing. Of course, I was a dreamer and maybe worse than a dreamer because in the 21st century, you cannot uh, act, think in these terms. Anyway, back to Val de Grasse, this great building by Mansart, Mansart and it is a great building. Um, you might not uh, be naturally inclined to like this, this, uh, this uh, aesthetic, uh, but uh, because it's somewhere in between classicism and, and Baroque, it's both. It has the exuberance of the Baroque, but it also has uh, the rhythmicity and even uh, maybe the simplicity is not so apparent. But um, Bansar was, was uh, was uh, valued and is valued as an architect who was able to, to bring some, some elements of, of classicism into the Baroque. And uh, it's an imposing building. It's a, it's a large scale building. And it's very possible he didn't work alone on this building. I mean, these churches were built uh, over a longer period of, period, period of time and they require the services of various architects. So um, we move forward. Um, it is strange when I first visited Paris, the, again, the little devil or not so little in me is, uh, whispered to me, write a book called Paris, la plus mediocre ville du monde. Paris, the most mediocre city in the world. That's, that was my first reaction. Uh, when I entered Paris. And I don't know if I would still entertain such uh, uh, you know, iconoclastic thoughts, but at that time I, I had this, uh, this uh, idea. And the French like opposition, they like polemics. I told this to some French people and they laughed and they said, you should have written it, you should read it, uh, uh, write it. Paris, la plus mediocre ville du monde. 
it's not mediocre, but I was coming from New York and it looked so small and almost pathetically so with almost all the buildings the same height because the Palace of Justice by Renzo Piano was not yet built, it's just the Tour Eiffel and Tour Montparnasse where the you know, like accidents on the uh, cityscape of Paris. Back to Val de Grasse, back to Francois Mansart, back to classicism, neoclassicism, back to imperial culture, because we are, we are talking about that. The French Revolution didn't yet arrive. No égalité, no fraternité, and no liberté as yet. Were people more uh, unhappy than us? I don't know. Anyway, the sky almost indifferent above us. So, Val de Grasse, Francois Mansart. Who again, and I apologize to him and to you, his birthday will be on the 23rd of, of January. In fact, maybe I should prepare myself a little better about him instead of talking about the uh, Palace of Justice by Renzo Piano and other related uh, manners, um, matters. It is, a, it is an, a rather disturbingly imperial church, if I can say something like this. The church is supposed to be the house of God, not the house of a uh, human emperor. But this facade, it could have been, you know, uh, anything, uh, it could have been something else, not necessarily a church. And uh, yeah, a nice uh, longitudinal section actually, well drawn and inside, uh, you know, the glory of, of, of the arts that contributed to the glory of the building. Why is it that today we don't have architects and, and artists collaborate uh, any longer. Why? Because there are so many struggling artists who have probably nothing to eat and, uh, you know, painting, uh, you know, depressed in some attic or some basement. I think they would welcome the collaboration with some architects. And I think the architect would also enjoy perhaps the collaboration with the artist. Like here. Uh, if you take away the art, the building is not the same. So, Val de Grasse, Francois Mansart, Paris. Paris, la plus mediocre ville du monde. Sorry about it. It's not mediocre, but uh, it could have been done. But, you know, I, 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 I read in Hannah Arendt that Paris was truly great at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And the reason for that, and that's why so many artists and writers and musicians and so on, they all flocked to Paris. They all wanted to be in, uh, in, 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 in the great city. But why was Paris then so uh, appealing to them? Because of the exterior spaces they had, the interstitial spaces, sometimes triangular. Uh, the, the, there were spaces for cafes, for bistros, for uh, restaurants, for where artists gathered and talked, and when they had a little bit of money, or if they didn't. Anyway, it was it was this aspect of Paris that uh, allowed uh, uh, people to to meet on the streets in uh, little squares and so on, and have a. Uh, the, almost the intimacy of a living room, but outside of the, the living rooms or the, the homes, the houses. But that is not possible any longer. Why? Because of its majesty, the car and the pollution. Paris was, and maybe still is, one of the most polluted cities in Europe. And, and uh, with, with so many cars around, running and running and running, and the pollution, uh, that that charm of Paris is gone. That's what Hannah Arendt said. That that Paris lost a lot because of the cars, and and she might have been right. 
but then the cars destroyed many cities, not just Paris. Even Frampton uh, said very clearly the car ruined the city. But, uh, you know, the car uh, has also, I guess, a um, beneficial uh, function and we cannot live without it. I don't have a driving license. I don't drive, although I lived for many years in the United States, but I never got a, a driving license. One day I will tell you how I failed miserably twice trying to get a, li a driving license. I, I just, I, I was uh, uh, unable to get it. So, Valde Grassin from the air, and then the fabric uh, tissue, uh, of, uh, the, the, the urban fabric of Paris. I like this picture, old picture. It's the nostalgic uh, me, uh, the old picture, uh, of the grass. It's a nice picture. And the plan of the, uh, of the church. Uh, it, is a, it is a fine building in, uh, in, uh, in city. Uh, it's just part of a much larger complex as you can see. So the relationship between the sacred and the profane is, uh, is probably uh, an imbalanced one because the profane seems to be much more extended than the church itself. 